Okay, guys, uh, I would like to welcome you to the Q&A with Andrew Hewson and Rob Hewson. Uh, Dan from Retro Owl will, uh, will assist us with uh, way better questions than I would have. Uh, but if you have any questions from the audience, we will be accepting questions from the audience. And if you need to ask them in Polish, I will gladly translate, so no worries there. And, well, our main feature is Andrew here. Uh, of Houston Consultants fame. And can we start? Yes. Absolutely. Now we're going to be covering obviously classic games like Iridium, Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies, Slam Tilt, one of the biggest pinball games of all time. And obviously more recently stuff like Hyper Sentinel as well. So please give a warm welcome to the stage Andrew and Rob Houston. Now, of course, Houston Consultants, a huge company in Britain back in the 80s. But how did your journey start in computers and video games? How did you first get into it? Uh, before I start on that, i just like to say it's very pleasant being here in Poland. It's my first visit uh, to Poland ever. What a wonderful city that you have. We've been in the old town this morning, and we rode here on electric scooters. Fabulous. The whole world should be riding on electric scooters. I'm going to buy one when I get home. Uh, but apart from that, how did I get started in, in uh, video games, or computer games as we called them back in the day? Well, I was a scientist. I did my degree in chemical physics, would you believe? Uh, and I was working on radiocarbon dating, for those of you who are inter interested in old things. Uh, radiocarbon dating at a museum in London. And this was a research laboratory. This was my first job out of university, and we had a computer, a 2100C a Hewlett Packard computer uh, with 64K of memory, a 16 bit computer, and it ran uh, probang, probang, programming languages like uh, Fortran 4. Now, uh, 64K of memory. Let me just explain to you what that looked like in those days. 64K of memory was a draw. A draw, like a filing cabinet draw. And inside it was uh, wires with little ferrite loops hanging from the wires. And that was each of those loops was a memory. I can see someone nodding there. Someone else nodding there. That's understanding. Each of those, and there they were all strung, strung out like so much washing uh, inside this big drawer. And I can remember being very excited on the day that I was actually allowed to look in that drawer because, of course, um, you didn't want to get any dirt in there or, or what, what have you. So we never opened the drawer except once. So that was my uh, beginning in, in computers, and that was the, uh, uh, about 1973. Along came in 1980, uh, the ZX80 from uh, Clive Sinclair. Uh, how many people here remember the ZX80? Hands up. Hey, how many have got one in their loft? Probably. <laughs> two. I've got two. Um, the, um, and along came the ZX80. And by this time, I was working as a statistician. Um, uh, my career had rather deviated. I was working as a statistician. I wanted to write a book. My ambition was to write a book uh, because I was working as a research scientist, and one of the things you had to be able to do was write up your experiments and what have you and write them up well. So I wanted to write a book. That was my ambition. I saw this ZX80, uh, and I knew that certainly in the UK, and I'm sure here in Poland as well, there will be people who would want to buy it. It cost £100, which was a reasonable sum of money, but not out of reach. Uh, so everybody, for the first time, could have a home computer. So I bought one, and I thought, I'm going to spend the money, I'm going to write a book. And that's what I did. I sat down, I set myself up with a, with a, a television screen and a tape recorder, uh, and this funny little bit of plastic, white plastic, with the uh, key on it. And I made some, I just wrote notes as I was uh, playing with it, wrote notes about how this was working. Uh, and so I wrote a book, Hints and Tips for the ZX80. When the ZX81 came out, Hints and Tips for the ZX81, 
not very good at, uh, I'm not very creative, I don't th uh, think of new ideas very easily. easily. Uh, and as luck would have it, um, I had a phone call uh, from a company in London. I live out in Oxfordshire, which is about 80 kilometers uh, out of London. I had a phone call from a company in London who were going to publish a magazine called Sinclair User. And because I'd published this book, two books, about the ZX80 and the ZX81, they wanted somebody to write a, a, what they called a helpline column for Cinco User. And so, I, would I write this column? Yes, I would. I was very impressed that they sent a photographer from London to take a picture of me holding my book uh, to publish in the magazine. And I wrote a column in that magazine every month for 10 years. Uh, 2,000 words answering people's questions about Sinclair computers. And that's what got me started. Um, my name got known, and soon people were sending me uh, little games that they'd written uh, on uh, for first the ZX80, uh, ZX81. I never got anything for the ZX80. First the ZX81. And we had a wonderful game called Pilot, which is a flight, sim flight simulator. Uh, which was written for us by a chap called Mike Mail, who went on to write other games for us. Uh, and um, we published that. And before you knew, knew where we are, we became a publisher. Well, this, of course, was Houston, Houston Consultants. It was. The name always sounded more like an accountancy company or something, though. Why, why did you come up with that name? Oh, ridiculous. I was doing some consulting work, uh, earning some money on the side. I had the bank account set up, had the name there, all the letterhead. Uh, and so forth. I used to just use the same, same name. And by the time I realized that it, that it had traction with people, it was too late to change it to something a bit more exciting. As I say, I'm not very good at... Um, at Memorable, though. People remember Memorable. it, yeah. I mean, Rob, you must have like, grown up around computer games then when, from a very young age. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly remember um, playing the Commodore 64 at home, which Dad had brought home from work. Uh, playing uh, Gribbly's Day Out, Iridium. We used to draw pictures of planets and sellotape them around the screen to pretend we were flying through space um, playing Iridium. So yeah, it was, it was great fun growing up around it and then um, you know, climbing amongst the cassettes at the warehouse and going along to trade shows and, and later on getting a bit more involved in it. So um, yeah, it was good fun. I mean, did, were you like a tester for your dad's games when you were a kid then as well? Uh, no, probably not. I mean, I think by the time it got to 21st Century Entertainment and the pinball games, I had finished high school and, and I, you know, worked at there as a summer job, making coffee and tea for people, and they let me test some games and, you know, let me think I was helping to, um, to do that. But um, no, I didn't get involved into the industry until uh, much later. Well, you did mention Iridium there, and that was such a groundbreaking game. I remember, you know, even Parallax Scrolling on a Commodore 64. That was... How, what's the story behind that game then, and where did that come from, and how was it so technically advanced? Well, uh, Iridium, fabulous game. Who's played Iridium here? Yeah, hands going up. Robert uh, mentioned... Uh, we have a copy. Excellent. Look at that. Uh, Robert mentioned Gribbly's Day Out, which was the first game from Andrew Braybrook, who wrote... Uh, Iridium. Who has played Gribbly's Day Out? Right. Oh, well, yes, me. The, um, that was our first game for the uh, C64, our first ever game for the C64, written by Andrew Braybrook. And I recommend you go and find it on eBay if you've got a C64 and play it, because it is fabulous. It's, nobody knows very much about it, but it is a fabulous game. But that was, that was Andrew Braybrook's first game for us for the C64, then he did Paradroid, and then uh, Iridium. Totally his creation, working with uh, Steve Turner, who um, Steve, Turner, Steve Turner wrote ZX Spectrum games for us, and Andrew Braybrook worked on the C64, but they were a team working in a company called Graph Gold. Um, and the really clever thing about Iridium, of course, uh, is that it's got this fabulous scroll, fabulous smooth scroll on the C64. Nobody have ever, ever achieved that prior to that date. But, of course, it cheats. 
uh, like all the best video games in those days, uh, there, there's something sitting there behind there that you don't really notice, which is that it's only scrolling the centre section of the screen. So instead of trying to scro scroll the whole of the screen they, uh, and doing it jerkily, they said, no, we're going to have a super smooth scroll, but it's going to be this center section of the screen. And the whole game is, is designed around just scrolling that uh, section of the screen. And it worked fabulously well, and it was a huge hit. And we shipped it on the 28th of February, 1986, a day that's burnt into my, into my brain. I stayed up all night uh, the, the night that we shipped that. I was so excited all night, because we did all the manufacture of these things ourselves. Uh, we had a cassette duplication plant by then. Uh, I stayed up all night uh, packing, packing cassettes into boxes, getting them out the door. That's one thing about Houston Consultants. It, it had a reputation for very high quality games. And did you ever feel the pressure to keep up that high standard? Was it like a, a constant challenge in a way to make sure that all the games were as good as the last one? Well, that's an interesting one because I was always interested in the technical development, development of the game. I, I've never actually been all that interested as a games player. I, I was always interested in the technology. So, of course, my bias in that direction was always to go, to, go looking for games that were doing and people who were working on something that looked interesting and then try, uh, try and see how a game could be built around it. I didn't have to do that very at all with Steve and, uh, and Andrew at Craft Goals. They did all that themselves. They were, they were excellent in that, in that regard. But certainly with my... So I don't think it was really uh, so much looking for... Um, to try and exceed what we'd done before. I was always looking for some kind of magic, something different, something new, uh, because... Isn't that what excites us all when we see something that we've never seen before? And I still think it's true. I mean, I've got a phone. I've got a mobile phone sitting in, in my pocket, just like the rest of you. Aren't they fabulous? Aren't they just tremendous piece, pieces of kit? And we're still finding there are still people inventing new things to sit on these phones. Um, at, great. And that's, what's, that's what really motivates me. So, so I think in terms of looking for the quality in the game, that really felt out, fell out of looking for the originality in the development and doing something new and exciting. One thing that I know a lot of labels and publishers around that time talk about as, as an issue was when kids figured out tape-to-tape -tape copying at home. I mean, how, how big of a problem was piracy? Oh, huge. I, I don't know, it was like here in Poland. I'm sure you were doing it too. Uh, I have people sidling up to me. Uh, nobody comes up and shakes my hand and says, hello, I used to pirate my, your software. And it's not as direct as that, it's more, I used to sell it to my mates in the play. Oh, yeah, I know. I know you did. I know you did. I would think that, I mean, we were estimating that probably for every game that we sold, there were another 10 copies being made. That was, uh, that was uh, the sort of number that was going on. Did it happen in Poland? Yes? No? No? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, see, we have, we have some. Yeah, of course. Of course, there was nothing very much we could do about it. Um, it did undermine uh, what we did. I think that the, um, uh, it wasn't the thing that made life really difficult for us, but it didn't help. Well, how did Houston go about making the change from the 8-bit platforms to 16-bit? Uh, we, uh, well, that was an interesting move. Robert and I were talking uh, about it on the, uh, on the flight over here, that... Um, when the 16-bit machines came out, we were obviously uh, excited by them and, and looked at the, the extra color graphics and the extra facilities on them. But in the end, once we got down the line, uh, we really realized that actually they were just, they weren't a great leap. They weren't the leak that producing computers were, was in the first place. They were just a step of development. And so we did a lot of work where we moved uh, our best games from 8-bit to 16-bit. Nebulous is, a, is an example. Who remembers Nebulous with the, the tower going round? Uh, a very, I mean, that was a wonderful design. I loved that. Uh, and, there's, and there's not many games that have uh, attempted it even today. Uh, the, uh, but that, w that went across to the 16-bit and was uh, very successful on 16-bit for us. So it was actually a, a sense of progression. And it wasn't until we got to, um, I would say, when we found uh, Pinball, 
uh, once we reformed as 21st century entertainment when, and we came out with Pinball Dreams, that we really understood what, uh, what we were trying to do uh, in the 16-bit uh, era. Well, why did the change happen from Houston Consultants to 21st century? The old company went down the tubes, uh, they, uh, went bust, uh, went broke. Uh, not my finest hour, uh, looking back on it, I could have rescued the company, I didn't realise it at the time, but I could have done. But what actually happened was that um, uh, we had, uh, by this time we were shipping all, all over Europe, not directly to Poland, I don't know how the products got into Poland, I mean, I think they came out of Germany to Poland, that's my guess. Um, but our, our German distributor, who was very important to us, 25% uh, of our turnover, uh, went into uh, uh, direct turnover uh, was from selling games into Germany. Uh, the um, a German distributor rang me up one day and said, um, "Yeah, I'd like to come and see you. You know, uh, I'm coming across to London. Can you come to London to meet me?" And blah blah blah. So uh, I went up to London to meet him to this wonderful hotel. I was really impressed with his hotel room. He had he didn't just have a bedroom. He had a you know a living room there as well. And I was. I was young and green, and I didn't realise you could do that sort of that, that sort of thing. So, uh, into this suite in, in the hotel, his suite that he'd ob obviously staying in. Uh, right now, how are you? Very well. Blah blah blah. Um, so, why? What, what can we do for you? Unfortunately, we can't pay you. He said, "We're running out of money." So, what? We can't pay. You. We're running out of money. Oh, not quite the news I was expecting. Can can you imagine that? can't pay. That's going to cause us some difficulty, and it did. Uh, and I put that company into liquidation, uh, not really understanding what I was supposed to be doing, but knowing that it was effectively a legal requirement. Uh, but we actually bought the assets back uh, uh, later on and formed 21st Century Entertainment. I mean, 21st Century Entertainment, I mean, those pinball games. Any fancy of pinball fantasies, pinball dreams, all those games? Everyone loved those games, but you really hit the ground running. But you know, with Pinball Dreams, the team from Digital Illusions, and um, we're still around today, is Dice, obviously. How did you get in touch with them and meet up with them, and how did the game development work then? We saw the game. They brought it to us uh, at an exhibition, and in fact, they showed it to uh, two or three publishers, I know for certain, and we were the ones that were quickest off the mark. And to be honest, when we saw it. I mean, I thought it was just obvious. I mean, it, it wasn't me that actually uh, they spoke to, first of all. It was one of the, one of the staff, but the, um, it's just obvious, looking, looking at what they got for Pinball Dreams. This was about nine months before it was released, so there was a lot of work still to do on it. But just, you could see the way it moved, just this, the sense that these people actually were pinball players, and what they were looking to do was to create that pinball experience which is exactly what they... And there, there was also a complete team. Uh, there were five of them, uh, including the musician uh, in, uh, in there. So uh, they were a complete team. They were only students at university, um, but they, they, it was very obvious that that was going to... Uh, you know, we were really excited and signed them up uh, very quickly. Um, and Pinball Dreams, we brought that out in March of 1991. Um, 92. He's right. Sorry about that. I'm getting old. He's the one who remembers things. Uh, the, uh, yeah, in March of 1992, and of, uh, with four tables on it, and my favourite table, I don't know about yours, my favourite table is the nightmare table. What a fabulous ab atmosphere. And it's all to do with the sound effects. And I think sound effects are so, so, so important for creating atmosphere when you're playing a game. Okay, you, 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 the visuals are important, but actually what goes in through your ears, this is where you hear the emotion of the game, to my mind. Yeah, and in that game, the bumpers had a really satisfying, clunky sound, and yeah, it did really brought it to life. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. The whole thing, the, the, game, the game was uh, fabulous. We brought it out on the Amiga. Uh, we, uh, we put it in a box. We were, we, uh, the artwork on Pinball Dreams, uh, we, ha we've got two, we had two versions of it. One of it was in a sort of pinky box, and that was the, that was the first artwork. We shipped about 20,000 units of that. Uh, and, then we and I never liked the artwork. I commissioned it, I, I, and when I saw it, I thought, there's no time to change this, but I don't like it. 
So it went, uh, the, the first version of it went out like that, and, and then we changed it to the green box. And, mo and those of you who have a copy, you've probably got it in the green box because we shipped thousands and thousands more uh, of, of those in the green box. Well, then after that, we had Pinball Fantasies, Pinball Illusions, Slam Till. I mean, you really owned that pinball genre. Well, you, you must have been proud looking back on those games and how well received they were. Yes. What I was looking for was a niche. By, by this time, I understood that competition was really intense and that our previous strategy of always trying to invent something new was actually deeply expensive and deeply naive because the fact is you cannot do it. You, you, the, there's always somebody else. There's so many other people competing with you. There's always somebody else doing something new. What you've got to do is find a niche. Uh, and all the successful games these days is try to establish a brand for, I mean, obviously the, there's Minecraft at, at the moment, where, where I look at it and I don't even understand why people play it, but they do. But there, that's a niche. And so with Pinball Dreams, when, once we'd signed it, I very rapidly made the decision that we were going to look to own that niche. Uh, and so uh, the first thing to do, uh, after uh, we shipped Pinball Dreams in March of 1992, thank you, Robert, <laughs> and the first thing I did was ring up the team um, in, um, in Sweden and, uh, and say, right, can we have uh, another one? I want it by September. Uh, and of course, these are students, and what they and they've just written this and, and put it to bed, uh, put it, put this great game to bed. Um, and what they wanted to do was rip their engine apart and start again because we're all the same, isn't it? As soon as you built something, you think, oh yeah, I could do that better. Oh, that better. I could do that better. I want to change that. That's very slow. That's what we all do, isn't it? We all want to to really. I've enjoyed that so much. I want to do it again. And I, I rang that and I said, no, please don't do that. Please don't. Please give me four more tables and give me three features, three very clear features in Pinball Fantasies, because I'd already, con I thought of that name, we've got Pinball Dreams, that was their name, Pinball Fantasies, it's an obvious way to develop the name. Um, give me three features that will be, that I can clearly show to anyone. And so if you look at Pinball Fantasies, the three features are, and they're on the back of the box, extra flippers, Pinball Dreams has two. Pin Pinball Fantasies has a third one up the top. Uh, it's got the extra colors. And the third feature is a bizarre one, but was very appropriate for the time. It has a dot, it's simulated dot matrix display, which these days you think, oh, what on earth do you want that for? But dot matrix, it, at that, just at that time, was very new. And so we had our three features. You can see extra flippers, better colors, dot matrix display. And there, four, four new tables, a whole new product. And of course, we shipped it in September. And September being the magic month for Christmas. And then when Illusions came along, I remember the first time I played that, then all of a sudden, the screen flipped into high resolution and an extra ball came out. I was like, what's going on here? I mean, was it hard to keep thinking of new features and implementing them like that? I didn't have to do any of that. Digital Illusions did all of that. Um, Pinball Illusions was their third game. We actually were all working with other pinball developers by then. And Pinball Illusions, they did rewrite the engine, which is why it took, them, it took another two years before Pinball Illusions came out. And we were filling the gap, so to speak, with them. Um, uh, we had other uh, pinball products like Pinball World uh, and um, Slam Tilt, as you say. Slam Tilt's a completely different team. Uh, Slam Tilt, who's got Slam Tilt? Yeah, the, I've got it. The, the, I, fabulous, a fabulous thing. Again, I look, I look at the box art I work and think, think we could have done better than that. What a f great game, great game. Well, I think Slam Tilt was my favorite of all the, the pinball games that you released, but the, I think the timing was just the Amiga was kind of fading away by then. If that game had come out like three or four years earlier, I'm sure it would have been like everyone would have owned a copy of it. I mean, did the Amiga's demise kind of hurt you then? 
Well, it was terrible, wasn't it? I mean, when the Amiga, uh, David Pleasance was here yesterday talking about uh, when Commodore uh, went under in 1994. I mean, that was a big shock, a big, big shock. We understood that Commodore were not really a particularly sensible company. They had a very strange uh, business strategy, uh, which was roughly make it up as you go along which I sort of understand, but nonetheless, we were expected rather better. Uh, and their big competitor in the, in the um, hardware market was, of course, Atari. And Atari were even more, make it up, well, they would make it up as they go along, but not be as good, really, was their, was their, was their strategy. Um, yeah, when Commodore went under, that, that was a big shock. By then, we were moving our pinball products to the PC, which was rapidly improving as a games platform at that, uh, at that time. It was hard work putting games on, uh, on the PC. And in fact, we were looking at, also looking at the Mac as a games platform. Uh, and there was at that time, I can't remember what it was called, but there was already a pinball product uh, on the Mac, which was tiny, tiny, uh, uh, you know, tiny images. Uh, and we thought well, we can easily do something better than that, but we never actually moved anything to the Mac. We also released fantasies on consoles as well. I know we I've got it on the Atari Jaguar. It was released on that. And I mean, it was releasing on a console, I guess, making cartridges and all that kind of thing. It was a lot more work than discs and more expense, I imagine. Yes, and we, know, we only licensed. I never manufactured for cartridges. I just didn't want to take the risk. Uh, we, uh, I mean, the risk was big enough for us as it was. That's, that's an important thing in all... Um, I mean, by, the, by this time, I was getting better at running a company and understanding more about how you've really got to think what your strategy is going to be and then execute it. And yes, this decision not to publish on, on ourselves on console, but only license, was a deliberate strategy. Well, Rob, around this time, I mean, you've told me before about how you used to play like pinball fantasies in the office and... Uh, compete for high scores and that kind of thing? Was that like a regular thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was with um, Barry Simpson, the producer on Pinball Fantasies. Uh, he sent home uh, an Amiga with Pinball Fantasies and a challenge to beat, actually it's Pinball Dreams because it was the steel wheel table, a challenge to beat his high score. And my sister and I spent the entire weekend and then, you know, late Sunday night, erupted in excitement at having beat his score and I sent a rather cheeky note back to Barry uh, at work mocking him gently um, uh, but then he, he got his own back because he saw he saw mum and I in the supermarket and um, just casually turned around and said that he doubled my score so, so yeah we, we had some we had a good it was good fun having banter with the with those guys and uh, yeah Barry in particular well, around that time, were you starting to get into programming yourself and looking at game design and that kind of thing? Uh, I, so I went to um, university and did computing science and did web development after that, and I got into games development around 2005. So um, I've been doing it ever since. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I've been a lead designer, game director, so I drifted away from the programming side of things. But, uh, yeah. You've worked on some huge games, like the Lego franchise. Uh, yeah, Lego games. I don't know if anyone's played any Lego games, Lego Star Wars, Lego Lord of the Rings, those kinds of games. So I did six, six Lego games in my four years at, at TT Games. And I was, you know, game director throughout the whole production. So that just tells you how quickly uh, we turn, they turn them around at TT Games. I've still got friends there, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, and, I've, um, and then left to start Huey after that. Well, let's talk about the, the comeback of Houston and development of Huey. I mean, why did Houston Consultants suddenly come back after like 25 years? What was the story there? My fault. Um, I, you know, I always wanted to have a stab at, at, at doing that. And um, first of all, um, twisted dad, dad's arm into to, to writing a book uh, that we funded on Kickstarter about Houston and 21st century entertainment, which is where I learned a lot of the, you know, I learned about it being 1992, not 1991, because I had to go and research all of that, and, and, you know. Um, so we did the book, and then we did Hyper Sentinel on Kickstarter, which is a kind of Iridium-inspired game, and we published that ourselves on PS4, Xbox, Switch, Steam, iOS, everything. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going on, we've got games in development, and um, on we go. One thing I love as well is the little cassette format that you release your games on. But if anyone's seen these, because I backed the Hyper Sentinel yeah, so Kickstarter then. 
so we did a Kickstarter yeah. reward, which was the USB cassette version of Hyper Sentinel. Um, so it slots into your collection. And uh, we're now doing, um, this is um, developed by Puppy Games. It's called Droid Assault, which is a, a paradroid uh, inspired style of game. Um, so there you go, flip it out. Then it's, uh, it's a cassette with a USB stick. So it's got the game on there uh, and lots of bonus features, interviews, documentary footage, all of that stuff. So that's actually on Kickstarter right now um, and, and was funded in the first two days. And we're going to do a whole series of these cassettes. So we've got a whole series of neo retro games that are, that are coming out on these cassettes that you can collect. Uh, so, so, yeah, feel free to check that out. I just love it as well when you get that through the door and you're like, it's like getting a Commodore 64 game in the post again. It's crazy, yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a proper cassette dual case. It slots right into the collection. It feels like, you know, you're getting a physical version of a modern game on cassette. It's brilliant. Well, tell us about the new game then. Tell us a bit about what it's based on, who's, who's involved with it. Uh, yeah, so Droid Assault, um, I don't know if any, has anyone ever played Droid Assault? They've got the digital version. Uh, so it's, um, Droid Assault is kind of based on Paradroid. It was developed by Puppy Games. And uh, if you imagine Paradroid, but much more fast-paced, action-packed arcade experience, plus when you hack the other robots, you actually acquire them into your uh, squad. So you move around with a squad of robots. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a spin on that classic gameplay. So um, yeah, that's Droid Assault. And uh, it's out on Steam. but. Obviously, the USB cassette version you can only get through the Kickstarter. And that's running right now? That's running right now, yeah. And Hyper Sentinel as well, you can still get hold of that? Yeah, we're selling those on the website. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, Iridium style game. It's on the N Nintendo Switch and all the consoles as well. And that's, that's been fantastic. That's done, that's done brilliantly. It's brilliant on the Switch. It is absolutely, the Switch is made for Hyper Sentinel, and Hyper Sentinel is made for the Switch. That's a platform I play it on as well as Switch. Yeah, it is. It's just, yeah, it's perfect on there. But again, I mean, because I grew up playing Iridium and Iridium 2, I remember. I loved that on the Amiga. And yeah, it is a real, like, tribute to that game. And every bit is fun. And, and even, like, I, I guess, getting those kind of retro style graphics, but doing things you could never do in those original platforms. And that, that must be, like, something that's amazing to do now. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the idea, is to capture the spirit of, it's almost like, uh, Jonathan Port, who uh, you know is the lead program on it, said it's like um, trying to capture how you remember the game was rather than the reality uh, of it. And so it's it's like Iridium on steroids. It's got Defender influences in there as well. Um, and as you say, it it looks the the style looks right, but you're throwing around so much stuff on screen at, at, at tremendous speed that you could never possibly have done it in the past. So it's, yeah, something yeah. just happens and you're like, whoa. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's great. Great fun. I mean, this whole retro thing, I mean, you know, it's demonstrated by massive events like this. It just seems to be getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I guess you never imagined when you were working on these games on the, the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 that people would still be talking about them and love them 30 years later and have an interest. Not a clue. Not a clue. Uh, I think if I'd had any sense, I would have realized it, but I never had any sense. I mean, it's, I'm not sure I've got that much now. I'm, it, it, somehow, life just shh, happens to you, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I think it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we all had a great deal of fine, uh, fun back in the day, didn't we? Uh, and why not relive it? Uh, but I do think it's a bit like this phone in your pocket. And it's a bit like Hyper Sentinel. Hyper Sentinel would be no good if it was just like an 8-bit game. It would not work. Um, it's fine playing an 8-bit game if you want to, but if you want to release a new one, it's got to be exciting and new for today. It can be done in the style of, that's fine, but it's got to work today. Uh, okay, uh, we're almost out of time, so I'd like to ask whether there are some questions from the audience. Yeah. If you, if you want to ask a question in Polish, I can translate. So don't worry, just go on. Don't be shy. Don't be. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, thanks for all the 
great games, but I have a question about one of the pinball games. One, one of my favorite pinball games is Slam Tilt. Yeah. So what, what happened? Because it wasn't released by... What was it released by 21st century? It wasn't... It, it was? Yes. Okay, because uh, is there any chance of bringing those games back? We don't own the rights to it. I don't own the rights, so I don't, I'm not able to say yes or no on that. Okay. Uh, the, that would be an interesting thing to do. I think that it would be technically very difficult to produce a proper pinball game today. That's, that's my, per, uh, my personal belief. Yeah, I know people are uh, trying it. But, just... but you know that both Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasies were, were released on iOS. And, uh, well, they disappeared uh, from App Store some time ago. Is, well, maybe there's a chance of bringing them back to Nintendo Switch, for example. Yeah, why not? But as I say, I don't have the right, so it's not okay. going to be me. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I might think do about we, it, I suppose. Do we have anyone else? Don't be shy. Yeah, be shy, be shy. Yeah, sorry, you talk about Hyper Sentinel and uh, the platforms, but also you can play on iPhone with Hyper Sentinel, you know, because uh, I've, I've played on uh, iPhone quite a lot on the train and wherever you are. So, uh, so you're releasing on multiple platforms these games. Yeah, so just, just list all the platforms you, that you release on. Okay. List all the platforms. Uh, Hyper Sentinel is on Steam for Windows, Mac, and Linux. PS4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, uh, iOS, and Android. I think that's all of them. Oh, and I, you know, we've got it on itch on PC as well. And we'll probably put it on more platforms uh, as, as and when. Excellent. Well, if you do want to get hold of any of the games, we are obscuring the website address, but you'll see it in a moment. Please give a big thank you to Andrew and Rob Hewson. Thank you very much. And thanks, Dan Wood, for the questions. <laughs>